Uh, thanks very much, Harriet. And it, it is, I am uh, really honored to be a, a fellow of, uh, with NEA and to be here today with, with you. As Harriet mentioned, the work I'm going to represent, and you know in this uh, time slot, I'm going to set the stage for the next half hour and then invite the, uh, the three leaders from Long Beach to join me. And then we'll uh, show how that how Long Beach is an example of what I'm talking about. And then we'll uh, have a half hour or 20 minutes at least uh, to hear from you and the audience uh, to the panel, including myself. So it should be a good uh, hour and a half. Uh, I want to um, say one main thing, which is everything I'm going to share with you are things that we and others are doing. This is no longer armchair research or distant research from a university. This is doing something and then writing about it, doing more and learning more, writing better, back and forth. And almost everything I've learned is from practitioners. I have a way of saying it that feeds it back to them in a succinct way, but it is coming from the field. I don't know whether you know the uh, incurable academic who was a professor of education who was taken out to a highly effective school and shown around all, all day and at the end of it shook his head and said, well, that's all well and good, but will it work in theory? <laughs> so, so we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Uh, Kurt Lewin said there's nothing so practical as good theory. I prefer to say there's nothing so theoretical as good practice. So let, but it's action oriented. This, uh, and I want to really emphasize the doing action part, the results part. And you'll see the title, and uh, I'll, I'll put my website up in a moment, or uh, email where you can contact me if you like for more of this. Uh, but I want to uh, just emphasize the two parts of the title. Uh, the first part, which is the moral, um, I'm going to go second and then up to the top, the moral imperative realized. Uh, there's a very, uh, the moral imperative is important because it's the commitment that we have in uh, all the work we do with system change to raise the bar and close the gap of all subgroups. And I mean all. Uh, so that, that, that is the, uh, the, the marker. But when you add the word realized, it says moral imperative isn't worth the two words unless you're getting somewhere. It's not a moral imperative. It's not an imperative unless you're getting somewhere. So I don't, uh, I'm, I guess I'll say uh, uh, Shania Twain, who's a singer in, from uh, Northern Ontario, in her, one of her songs you'll know, she says, that don't impress me much, uh, was one of her lines. And, and so uh, big plans don't impress me much, uh, that they have to actually lead to something. And so realized we're going to keep pushing that element, and certainly Long Beach represents realization. The other part is whole system reform. And this means that the work we are doing uh, is uh, improving classrooms and schools system-wide. And by system-wide, I mean the minimum size the district, but we actually prefer to work with more clusters of districts, whole states, whole provinces, whole countries, but at least the district, minimum size. So let's take uh, a look at this. The work, uh, I'll use the word we a few times, and it really means that uh, it's a team I have in Toronto, mostly in Toronto. Uh, there's about uh, 10 or 11 of us. Uh, some of them are policy people. Um, ben Levin, who works uh, with me a lot. Michael Barber, who's actually not in Toronto, but uh, also policy. We have system capacity building design trainers who are basically curriculum instruction people and, uh, and a couple of others. So we have been um, working on this in Ontario for the last, this is our ninth year. And I'll just give you a snippet of that, but I'm not going to dwell on Ontario. And I, I won't even say that we've invented these ideas in Ontario. In fact, we borrowed from England, we borrowed from this country and others in putting this together when we started in 2004. Uh, but we had the chance to put it systematically into practice. And uh, I'll say Ontario is not Finland and it's not Singapore. It's like you uh, in many respects and uh, s some differences, but basically we're talking about this is doable on a large scale. Uh, I spend a lot of time in, um, in this country back and forth. Uh, I am working with Chris and, uh, and the core group. It's called the uh, California Office of Reform and Education, but it's basically eight districts, sizable districts that have had success and want to not only get uh, continued success in their eight districts, but spread, spill over to other districts. So again, we're uh, making yards on the system itself. And, uh, uh, and we've worked 
um, we're just about to start into uh, trying to influence the next 10 years in New York City uh, with, by saying the last 10 years have not been very good for reform, the wrong driver's problem. And so we're working with the New York uh, City uh, Commission on Excellence to try to influence the next mayoral uh, stint, which will be about a year from now. So I, I could say more about the various places in this, but all, in all cases, it's this interest in uh, bigger reform. Uh, th this is just my website and, um, and my email. Do feel free to email me after today. I handle all my own email. I'm glad to respond to you and he hear from you about things that you're doing. A few watchwords. Uh, motion leadership is uh, one of our themes that we write about and do about. Motion leadership is the kind of leadership that causes positive movement in individuals, in schools, and in school systems. So again, the whole system reform that actually the, good, the leadership that causes movement by mobilizing other leaders. The gold standard for motion leadership for me is when you cause someone to change who is against the change, and then they thank you afterwards <laughs> for having done it. Uh, so it is about real movement, not just getting those that already agree on board. The skinny is another uh, theme we use. The skinny, um, the, the phrase in the Second World War, don't give me complicated explanations. What's the skinny? What's the essence of this? So we have a lot to, uh, uh, we're trying to uh, actually pare that down so that you get a small number of really powerful things. Uh, related to that is simplexity, obviously not a real word, but simplexity means there actually are a small number, probably for me six, eight things that you have to get right. So that's the simple part, getting them right is the complex part, the chemistry, getting it to gel with complex groups uh, uh, across the whole district, for example. And then whole system reform I've already mentioned. Uh, uh, a key to this, and you have uh, heard it this morning quite a few times, is the motivation that people, the energy that comes from motivation. So I'm going to show you just a short video clip, probably a minute long, which is a depiction of somebody who's evidently in, a, in an occupation that's not very motivating. So she has to make it up. So let's take a look. I observe the accused make a left-hand turn at 3.14 p.m., contrary to section 144.79 of the HTA. Could you please read back the last few lines? The rain is falling hard on the hood of the cruiser. Officer Duffy looks at his watch. It's just past three when he sees the black convertible make an illegal turn. Close up on Officer Duffy. Where do you think you're going, punk? The punk pulls a gun from his jacket. To hell. And I'm taking you with me. So we don't want to... Uh, we don't want students and teachers fantasizing to get through the day. Uh, and so... Uh, let me just reinforce this, uh, and I'll get more positive in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but one of my colleagues, Lee Jenkins, uh, in this country, sent me this graph that we already know this, but it's dramatic when you see it. And uh, it's data that he has been collecting from uh, two or 3,000 teachers over the last few years of different grade levels, where he asked them, what percentage of students in your class or in your grade are enthusiastic about schools? And uh, there are actually other studies of surveys that are similar to this, but I like his graph, and if you take a look at it, you'll see that it goes, it starts very high, kindergarten, and it goes down, down, down. By the time you get to grade nine, 37%. This is an average, obviously, and the good schools that are working in the districts are different than this, but this is uh, kind of the big picture. <coughs> and uh, it blips up a bit near the end. And 37%, this means a lot of disengaged students to contend with. Uh, the MetLife survey that uh, just came out uh, in March, uh, also tells a, a actually a dramatic story because of the decline in the in the two-year period. Uh, that from 57 percent uh, uh, teachers that are uh, pretty satisfied to 44 percent. That's a hell of a decline in two short years. It's incredible. And the number of teachers that might be thinking of leaving the profession uh, is going up as well. So th this is, uh, as we say in professional capital, it's a function of the way that the profession is treated and the way it's shaped, and this is where it's leading to. But I guess the way to say this, and this is the big problem to start with, is that um, there's a vicious circle here with bored students and alienated teachers 
So it means lots of people who are there in a school that would rather be somewhere else. That's what it means. And that's why the uh, innovations that we're talking about, the, the mobilization of these things, have to crack this and reverse this trend and make it incredibly engaging. And that's what I'll uh, talk about as we go through. A uh, moral imperative, well, I've already uh, uh, emphasized this, so I'm not going to say much other than to remind you that the center of gravity for this work needs to be the moral imperative realized. In other words, the center of gravity is what progress are we making on this? And in, uh, in our workshops, I'll just give you some questions we use, uh, and you can do this on your own if you like, but if, I, if we were in a real workshop now, I'd ask you individually to finish these uh, following four sentences. If you were to think, moment, uh, focus on yourself and say, my moral imperative is, how would you finish that sentence? If you would then go to the second one is, and say, to what extent is my moral imperative shared, not only at the school level, but at the district level? Maybe you'll find a big discrepancy there or not. And then so on in those other two questions. So this is usually where we start because we want people to be front and center on the moral imperative. And we want to set the expectation that this is about movement. This is about realizing it and doing something about it. Uh, you have in your packet a, a, a shorter version of the policy paper I did last year, which is called uh, Choosing the Wrong Drivers for uh, Whole System Reform. And also, I want to get into that. I'm shifting um, as we go through this to more and more, what are the right drivers and how do you make sure the right drivers are carrying the day? But since most politicians tend to gravitate towards the wrong drivers, for some reasons that I'll mention um, in a few minutes, we have to worry a lot about that. So what is, uh, on this uh, driver notion, what is the concept of driver? It's pretty straightforward. Driver is this combination. It is a uh, policy and associated set of strategies that are designed to make a positive difference. Driver makes a positive difference. A wrong driver is one that purports to do that, but there's no evidence in the world that that actually can happen. Uh, and you might ask, well, why would a politician choose a wrong driver when there's no evidence? Uh, ask uh, Julia Gillard, who is the uh, premier, uh, the prime minister of Australia, who, uh, when they decided uh, three or four years ago to do the uh, major uh, system reform across the country, her main advisor was Joel Klein. Like, why would you, why would you think of moving into the driver territory by taking examples that probably don't work, why wouldn't you go and take examples that do work? That, that's a bit of a, a, a complaint. Uh, so that's the, the wrong driver. The right driver is the flip side of that. It is uh, how things really uh, make a difference and that, and that there are actually policies that, and uh, drivers that do that that I'll uh, surface for you. When I say wrong driver, I just want to be careful about the language here. I mean wrong as a driver. I don't mean wrong, wrong, wrong. And you'll see uh, in a few minutes when I show you the paired drivers, the four, four pairs, that the uh, right drivers, if they're in the driver's seat, then they can use the other drivers to get there or the other elements to get there. But it has to be that the dominant part has to be the right part and the other part has to be in the service of the right part, uh, whereas uh, politicians have uh, turned it around. The criteria I've used to set this up, uh, the, in other words, to judge these policies, is does the policy, if you put it into practice, uh, foster the intrinsic motivation of teachers and students? Not necessarily the next day, but does it kick in pretty soon? Does it, uh, does it uh, engage teachers and students to uh, be part of a process of continuous improvement? Does it actually inspire teamwork, or does it undercut teamwork? Because we know, and I'll come back to social capital, Teamwork is the one that has the most impact if you're focused. And that's very clear. It's been clear for 40 years. And, uh, and so, so, so that. So we're thinking about this, because uh, this is about the big policies we're talking about. Here's the set. And uh, if you uh, go down uh, the left-hand side, uh, punitive accountability, external accountability, individualistic strategies, teacher appraisal being one of them, that actually combines two wrong drivers in one punch uh, when, you, when you do it with, uh, w in a negative way. Uh, technology, <clears throat> we've been actually working with technolo 
technology very positively in the uh, innovative work we've done in the last year. And it's clear in this work that at least we're doing that pedagogy is in control and, and technology helps us get there a lot faster. And that's the reverse side. And similarly with uh, uh, systems versus fragmented strategies. So let's tackle accountability because uh, every system has to deal with accountability. When we started in Ontario in 2004, uh, the public wanted um, um, uh, some uh, accounting for the investments, for the results that we said we were going to get. And here's what good accountability uh, entails. It's a function of good data, but data that are used primarily as a strategy for improvement. Primarily, dominantly as a strategy for improvement. Uh, secondly, it's, uh, it's uh, done in a way that has non-judgmentalism, a bit of an odd word, but non-judgmentalism is when you look at ineffectiveness and you don't immediately blame the people that are in the situation. You actually go to capacity building as the main response. And you'll see in the, in the high performing systems like Long Beach and, uh, and Sanger, which is another member of the core group that we filmed, that they have, they're very relentless about the agenda. They're really serious in your face about the agenda, but it doesn't have the flavor of negativism. It doesn't have the judgmentalism. It has, how are we gonna get better? And we do get better, we celebrate it. Uh, this is a very important part of motivation, actually. A non-judgmentalism undercuts motivation in an obvious way. And then um, all of this uh, produces what Richard Elmore <coughs> called internal accountability to the group itself. Uh, that again, because we have Long Beach here, uh, they, they are accountable to the state system, but they don't need the state system to tell them how to be accountable. They're accountable to themselves as a group, the board, the union, the uh, teachers and principals and all the schools. Uh, it's built in, and so that, that's an important part. And what this does, we also use a lot of data, what you call it infusing faces on data, infusing it with instruction. Uh, if you, uh, uh, here's, what, here's my conclusion about accountability. If you, pr if you pursue it indirectly, which this is, you actually get better public accountability. That's what's hard for politicians to, uh, to, uh, to understand, I think. They get better accountability if it's like this. So why do politicians choose wrong drivers? Uh, we can think of perverse reasons, and there are some, I'm sure. But, well, but at least two of the more obvious ones is they want quick fixes. So they, uh, they, they act uh, quickly. But the, uh, the other is they can control legislation, so they legislate it. Neither of those, quick fixes or legislation, is much of a lever for change, for real change. Yet they keep repeating that. And there, uh, there are deeper reasons, which uh, might be that some of them are not interested in a strong public school system. They're not, they're not, their values are such that they're not committed to a strong public system. So what we've done with accountability is uh, um, balance it with capacity building. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward proposition. Capacity building is anything you do to improve the knowledge, skills, competencies, and motivation of individuals, but especially uh, groups, to do the uh, core work of, uh, of instructional improvement and student achievement. And so um, we, we uh, in our, all of our strategies, every, one, every success you will see, you will see the collective capacity building underway. Uh, on thinking about the, uh, the individual part here, uh, here's, the, here's the reverse again. Uh, take personnel policies. That these successful systems work away at the uh, emphasis on implementation, and then they reverse it by, uh, by back it up is a better word, by selection and mentoring of new people coming in, whether it's principals or teachers, so they're gaining on it all the time, but their main route is not to get so-called individuals in there, their main route is to do the work and then reinforce it with the individual uh, uh, part of this. So, uh, third one, uh, human and social capital, very important part in, uh, uh, you, many of you have the uh, professional capital of teachers. Uh, human capital is the quality of the individual, uh, qualifications of the teacher. Social capital is the uh, quality of the group. And he, there's a neat little study that Carrie Liana did. She's a business professor at University of Pittsburgh in New York City. She took a sample of uh, 135 elementary schools. She measured only three things. 
One was the human capital, the qualifications of teachers on paper. If a lot of them had qualifications, she gave the school a high score on human capital. And then social capital, she asked questions like to teachers, to what extent do teachers in this school work in a focused, trusted, collaborative way to zero in on the improvement of teaching linked to student achievement? If a lot of teachers said, yes, that's the way we work here, she gave this, uh, the school a high social capital score. And then the third thing, she measured math at the beginning of the year, the end of the year. You can see where I'm going with this. She found just three things, several things, but I'll just say these three. Uh, schools with higher social capital did better. Schools with both human and social capital being high did best, uh, for obvious reason. I'll come back to the sequence in a minute. And she also found that teachers who had low human capital, who happened to be in a school with high social capital, did better. In other words, they improved their math just by virtue of being in that kind of interactive learning environment. So very powerful stuff. If you think of the sequence here, uh, a, a lot of the strategy now that the current administration is using is individualistic. Praise all of this, traction of leaders and that. There's some elements in there you can use later, but not as a driver. Because what they will do is they try to maximize human capital and never get there. But they're not paying attention to the social capital, which is the powerhouse. And, uh, and it's hard, it's, in other words, it's hard for an individual to change social capital. It's very powerful for social capital to change individuals if it's on the right track. So this is uh, one we could spend a lot of time on and I hope the uh, panel will uh, exemplify some of this. Uh, and then this work we're doing now on technology and pedagogy is how can we now reverse that so that pedagogy and some of the new work is terrific. It's got potential for that boredom and that alienation side, the work that uh, basically it's the new pedagogy, I want to call it. It's the partnership, and I do mean partnership, between teachers and students, partners in pedagogy, where students have more control over their lear learning, uh, students work interactively with each other. The teacher is change agent. Let me give you one interesting finding from John Hattie's uh, research on effect sizes. <clears throat> when his 900 meta studies, he pulled all this out. This one that interests me the most is he, he did a cluster of uh, factors that he put under the label of teacher as facilitator. And the uh, effect size was 0.17. I'm going to say teacher as mere facilitator. Then he did another one, which was teacher as activator, different word, and that was 0 0.60. Teacher as activator is teacher as change agent, co-designer, uh, right in there interacting with that. Technology accelerates that if you have the pedagogical definition uh, and uh, development uh, correctly as we are working on now. It's very powerful. It's, a, it, it, it's, it does, it's not that it doesn't exist anywhere, but it only exists on a very small scale. I'm talking still about whole system reform. And then we take um, a fragmented versus systemic. Uh, fragmented are these ad hoc policies. This is a, a word from uh, um, the McKinsey report where they studied 20 entities around the world that were uh, systems that were on the move uh, by, by, uh, by measurement of impact on learning. And they said, they basically said, well, the ones that are on the move, it's a system thing. They don't have ad hoc policies. They have policies that are uh, cohesive, they're inter integrated. And then more recently, we think of it this way, uh, most people think of alignment, and that's okay to think of. You put it, things together, make sure they're aligned. But I don't like alignment because you can do alignment on paper, and alignment isn't felt by people that are doing the work. So I much prefer the word coherence. Uh, to what extent, if you're in the school, does the policy of the district, uh, do you experience it as a coherent policy? Alignment is structure. Coherence is mindset. And it's the mindset that counts. And to go back to social capital, it's shared mindset. And shared mindset is where the power is again, because if you have a shared mindset, you're interacting uh, with focus, you're building on each other's work, you're moving forward. So um, uh, let me just say uh, uh, in the last uh, four or five minutes I have, the professional capital uh, work that Andy Hargaves and I uh, just did, we were in New York City yesterday for uh, developing, uh, uh, announcing some of this with the uh, Teachers College Press. Uh, it consists of three things for us. Uh, the, I've already said the first two. The third one I want to underscore, we call it decisional capital, but it really means that the group is making the best decisions for the student learning. It's the instructional specificity and provision, 
uh, precision and expertise that comes. So it's not just getting together and having shared visions. It's getting together and actually causing something to happen. And that, that's something that's happened is, is actually pretty specific because it has to be precise. It has to be linked into the personal learning of, of teachers and students. It has to develop from there. So uh, we're in this book, we're uh, putting together the combination of the words we use now, emotion leadership, are push, pull, and nudge. You can see where those words mean literally. Uh, and for change to move, some people need to be pushed. Some people are pulled into the vision and want to do it. And some people nudge you how to get those three things operating. And I'll say, because we, we're fairly assertive about the strategies in whole system reform, or to put it another way, we're fairly pushy. And my criterion for uh, pushiness is I want to push as much as I can get away with. If I, if, in other words, if it's not working, people will tell me. So this, uh, I, I want to think of, and, and we have action guidelines in this book that has to do with what's the action guidelines for teachers, what's the action guidelines for uh, administrators at the school and district level, and the third set is for system leaders, which include politicians and union leaders and others at the system level. So these all are about uh, moving on this agenda, the kind of agenda you're talking about in these two days, but really mobilizing, doing something even if somebody else is not doing it. And in our, our work on, uh, I guess, on doing this, the emphasis is if you want to change the group, use the group to change the group. This is a powerful social capital uh, atmosphere. So this one, I just, uh, uh, we'll just introduce this uh, uh, Stratosphere book, the most recent one we did, which is trying to integrate technology, pedagogy, and change knowledge. I've already forecast that around the John Hattie research. It links into the Common Core state standards. Uh, this way that uh, we have standards and assessment, if you look at those three uh, legs of the stool, standards and assessment are pretty prominent when people think of the Common Core state standards. But the real power is the pedagogy the third stool, and it's the one that be, to, to be uh, least likely to be attended to well. So you need, uh, you need pedagogues, and let me show you just a very, uh, very short clip here uh, that what happens if you don't have a pedagogue uh, when you have an innovation. Uh, it's in German, but you won't need to know German to appreciate this. Uh, this is a, uh, an adult uh, woman who bought her father an iPad. Sag mal, Papa, habe ich dich noch gar nicht gefragt. Wie kommst du denn eigentlich mit dem neuen iPad zurecht, was wir dir zum Geburtstag geschenkt haben? Gut. Mit den ganzen Apps kommst du klar? Was denn für Apps? Geh mal bitte einen Schritt zur Seite. So. Was denn? So you need a pedagogue. Uh, let me close with the uh, criteria, two things. The criteria we're using now in relation to this innovative work with digital technology, and then the uh, what I, a summary kind of slide or two about whole system reform, which will be a segue to the Long Beach group. Uh, here is our, uh, the criteria that I think of as we develop the innovations we're doing now, which are digital film uh, related to the Common Core State Standards. The solution, if you like, the educational innovation solution has to be irresistibly engaging uh, uh, for teachers as well as students. It has to be elegantly easy to use, not so complex that you get lost in the kind of uh, technology of complexity. It has to use technology 24-7, even though there are dangers of that. It can't keep closing the classroom off from, uh, from the information around the clock. And remember, the other three are also guiding this. And four, it, it needs to be steeped in real life problem solving, because again, that's where the motivation is, that's where the higher order skills are, uh, teaming, uh, of critical uh, uh, communication, problem solving. Uh, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, all of those things are in there. The higher order skills are grounded in steeped in real life problem solving if it's led by these, uh, these parts. So this is what we're working on now, this combination of uh, solutions around uh, make it all about learning, take the chance of letting technology permeate, and make sure it's a whole system reform focus. So let me give you two slides to end with, and I'm not going to actually state them because you have them. One is about uh, whole system reform. There's probably eight things here. 
Uh, this is my summary of what we did in Ontario, what was behind it. And the combination of these eight things is what caused it to work. And it, these are the types of things. You can fool around with the list and use different labels here and there. But basically, it's the synergy of these things uh, going together. And, uh, and I think I'll stop with that slide because what I want to say is this is the essence of whole system reform. And although I'm using it here to talk about a whole province or state, the identical thinking applies to a district. So, uh, so this, is, this is the introduction. I'd like the three people from Long Beach to come up. I'll introduce them. We'll set the stage for the next part. So they, they will join me right now. Thanks very much for this part. We'll go. Okay.